everyone. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Let's all stand together. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise. Sing it from your heart tonight. Here we go. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad. this evening and uh, man looking forward to a good service tonight and a great service this morning and uh, this past week as well and uh, so let's just go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to bless our service tonight father do thank you uh, Lord that we can come again into your house and worship you and uh, Lord we thank you that we can sing praises to you uh, Lord we thank you that as we look at creation it truly declares uh, the handiwork and the glory of God and uh, Lord we know that if you care about all of that that we can see uh, Lord, how much more you care about us. And so, Father, we thank you that we can come tonight and worship you. We ask that, uh, Lord, tonight our, our singing and our giving and even the message would be honoring and glorifying to you. And, uh, Lord, that you would be blessed through it all. And so, Father, we ask that you would just work in the service tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, right, go ahead and stand, and Brother Shane will come lead us in another song. All right. What a wondrous message in God's Word. My sins are blotted out, I know. What a wondrous message in God's Word. My sins are blotted out, I know. If I trust in His redeeming blood, my sins are blotted out, I know. My sins are blotted out. I trust in his redeeming blood, my sins are blotted out, I know, my sins are blotted out, I know, my sins are blotted out, I know, they are buried in the depths of the deepest sea, my sins are blotted out. Well, if you have a bulletin, let me just remind you of a few things we have coming up. Um, 
we got home and my wife asked me, she said, did you forget something this morning? I said, I don't think so, did I? Uh, she said, wasn't there an announcement video you're supposed to show? I was like, you're right. So uh, you didn't get the announcements this morning, so I apologize for that. Um, so let me just kind of run through some of these with you tonight. Uh, of course, don't forget, this Tuesday is the Ladies of Faith, and uh, so I encourage all the ladies to come out at 7 o'clock uh, for that. And then our men's prayer breakfast is at uh, 9 a.m. on Saturday, and so I'd love to have all the men come out for that, and both of those uh, the Ladies of Faith and uh, Men's Prayer Breakfast, just great times of, of fellowship, but then studying the Word of God together. And this year, our theme that we're looking at and studying both in the ladies and in the men's uh, time is uh, on friendship and uh, very, very uh, important, obviously, in the day and age in which we live. And uh, so I encourage you to be there for that. And then on the 25th, uh, this coming Sunday, we have a teacher worker meeting. Uh, at 445, so just want to remind all of those about that. Uh, and then also, if you are interested in helping with VBS, uh, if you could be there uh, for that as well. And then on the 30th, the Wiser Society is uh, going to be going to Ainsley's Cafe uh, over in Brookville uh, by Brookville Lake. And so um, all of those that like to do that, they'll be meeting at the church at 1230 uh, and then going over there. Uh, and then in May, of course, May being Mother's Day, we have our ladies' luncheon, which is a great outreach to, to ladies, and so uh, we'd encourage you to invite someone to come to that, and uh, there is a cost for it. It's $8, and that just basically kind of covers the food that is there because we're having it catered, and uh, so the cost is basically for the food, uh, but we also have a special guest speaker that's coming in for the ladies as well, and uh, so just looking forward to uh, a great day there with the ladies, a great opportunity to invite someone to come for that. I know a few have signed up already, uh, but you can go to the church website and uh, you can register online there, and we do need to do that by uh, May the 1st, and so uh, don't forget about that, all right? Uh, we'll have our ushers go ahead and come this evening, and we'll take up our offering and uh, just giving back to the Lord as he is blessed as well, and so have our men come. Brother Rob Wagenstall, would you come tonight and ask the Lord's blessing on the offering, please? Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your house this evening. We pray, Lord, for our service this evening. We pray your hand be upon the pastor as he brings the message to us. We pray, Lord, for those not able to be with us this day and sick and ill. We pray you watch over them. We pray, Lord, for this country and the, the ones we elected in office. We pray that you give them the right uh, decisions to make. We pray for our military protecting our freedoms throughout the world. We pray, Lord, for this offering. We pray to go on for the cause of Jesus. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have uh, the bulletin still there, we'll go to the back and look at our country uh, of the week and our missionaries of the week. And uh, the country is the country of South Sudan, South Sudan. And uh, this is actually kind of probably one of the most newest countries uh, in the world uh, over the past few years. Uh, but South Sudan, 
and uh, of course uh, used to be part of the entire Sudan there, which was a very large country, uh, and then split off a few years back. But South Sudan, a uh, population of about 11 million uh, in, in that area, and uh, again, great need for the gospel there. Um, a lot of persecution going on there because of Islam and things like this, but um, still a great need for the gospel. We had some missionaries one time, if you notice right below South Sudan is Uganda, and we had some missionaries that were right there on the border that were trying to get in into South Sudan and things like that, but uh, there's a great need for the gospel there, and uh, so I hope you be praying for the country of South Sudan this week. And then our missionaries of the week, we have Bob and Cindy Rasmussen, and the Rasmussens are missionaries in Ontario, and uh, up there, anybody remember where they're at? What was the area that they were called? Anybody remember? Miss Donna? Pickle Lake, that's right. Pickle Lake, Ontario. How can you forget that, right? I mean, Pickle Lake. That's just one in a million right there. So, uh, But they're there in Pickle Lake, Ontario, uh, which is really uh, kind of northern, uh, a lot farther north than what I would want to go in, in the wintertime. Uh, but be in prayer for the Rasmussens. And again, in Ontario, if you've been following some of the things that's going on, uh, you know, just not very easy right now. Uh, as far as churches and, and lockdowns and things like that are concerned, but they're still trying to reach out to uh, some of the school-age children and some others and things, so uh, just be in prayer for the Rasmussens there uh, in Ontario. And then we have Keith and Debbie Gandy, uh, who are missionaries in Ger Germany, and the church has supported them for, for a number of years, and Brother Gandy sent us a video and uh, just a little update there, so guys, if we can go ahead and uh, get that. Hello, First Baptist. This is your staff missionary in Germany, Keith Gandy. I would like to say greetings. Glad that we can have this time together. Uh, you've been faithful in partnering with us, and let me give you a quick update. I've been asked specifically the question, is there anything specifically we could pray for? One of the major things within Germany right now is a lockdown. And our membership is suffering. Germany has relationship difficulties as it is, but then the isolation is starting to, to weigh heavily on people. So please pray that our church membership will sense the closeness of Christ and also draw together and minister to one another during this crisis. Somebody's asked if there uh, is a personal need that we can pray for. The personal burden that I carry uh, is a ministry issue. Our particular fellowship, the Baptist Bible Fellowship, has been in Germany since 1972. And never once has a church been started by a missionary church planner and turned over to a national. And we're very, very close. I would like to see us complete the task of creating an indigenous church, self-propagating, self-governing, and self-supporting. So that is probably the biggest prayer request that I have. We're very close in doing that. Matter of fact, the church facility that we're in now, the church has actually bought, bought that, and in four years it will be completely paid off within their own membership, over a million dollars, and they are doing this while they're also paying for staff and sending missionaries. Have there been victories within our ministry or families? Uh, and yes, it's great that we can report this. The greatest joy that I have is that we've sent out, out of our own membership, we have sent members uh, overseas. We're planting churches in Lithuania, and we are now, we just now sent out our youth minister and his wife, dedicated to go to Southeast Asia. So it's our greatest joy to have put missionaries on the field. Also, what was the biggest difficulty or that we've ever faced in ministry? We've been through many ups and downs, health-wise, but probably the biggest would be making the mistake. Jesus said that we are to be fishers of men. And I made the mistake coming over that we are Europeans by descent, so therefore we must think alike. That was not true. And I had to learn how to understand what type of fish are we fishing for and having to understand what a postmodern, cynical German looks like. So we are targeting young 30-year-old engineers that are educated, 
that are still broken, something's missing in their life. And so figuring out who we're fishing for, that means statistical studies, that means understanding the culture and the sociological issues. You've partnered with us and we've done a, a amazing uh, work in the fact that we have now six churches that are up and going, two more did not uh, make it. In addition to that, we have Iranian mission, missions that we have. People have come in to, to land in Germany, and so the Great Commission is happening in our ministry, even here. On Monday, as I'm recording this, on Monday I will go with a, a young man by the name of Kumars, an Iranian that came over and saw the hand of God in his life. God touched him and his wife. He prayed that God would heal her of cancer, and and he did. And he said, if he's powerful enough to do that, I want to know him. So he came in touch with us. We introduced him to Christ and baptized him and his wife, Miari. I will go with him now to court on Monday before a judge. Thank you for allowing us to partner with you, bring you up to date to our beautiful city here with the castle behind me. Come visit us. We'll be ready for you. God bless you. Amen. So praise the Lord for that update there and what God's doing in Germany. Um, six churches being established and working to try to turn those over to uh, German nationals and obviously people there. Uh, but how exciting to be able to see uh, them sending out missionaries as well. And uh, that's, that's what every church ought to be doing. Doesn't matter where you're at or what you're doing. Uh, every church ought to be working to try to get the gospel around the world, and so that's exciting, and praise the Lord. I've never had the opportunity to meet uh, Brother Gandhi personally, uh, but I know the church has been supporting him for, for many, many years, and so uh, be praying for him and his wife, and uh, they've battled some health issues in the last few years as well, and uh, so I hope you'll, you'll be praying for them this week, and let them know. Let them know you'll be praying for them uh, and the ministry there in Germany, all right? Uh, if we have any young people that would like to say a verse tonight, we'll go ahead and let the young people come up at this time, and we'll let them say a verse. All right, a few of them coming up tonight. All right, Miss Haley, come on over. You going to go first, Miss Haley? Come on. Very good. Look. And to me and be saved. I say uh, 43 5. Very good. Good job. All right. Hmm? Hey, guys, want to another Ephesians? Very good. Good job, buddy. All right. Turn and stay away from idols for this is right. Children, stay away from idols for this is right. John 5, 27. Very good. Hold on a second. Can you tell, can you tell everybody what you did on Tuesday? I got saved. Amen. Amen. Very good. Amen. Miss Bella? I send the Lord on every place, holding the evil and the good. Very good. Good job. All right. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Psalms 56 3. Very good. Good job. Jude? What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Psalms 56 3. Very good. Good job. Miss Abigail? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. Very good. Ms. McKenna? Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Very good. And they that know thy neighbor, but the trust in me, for thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. So my ten. Very good. Good job. Let's give him a hand this evening. more be thou my vision be thou my vision oh Wow. 
Amen. Well, let's take our Bibles tonight. And tonight, as I mentioned this morning, we're continuing our series on, um, on the Baptist distinctives, basically what we believe, why we, uh, why we are Baptists, and we're using kind of the word Baptist as uh, an acrostic as far as uh, making it kind of easy to remember what it is that, that we believe in. Um, and so the letter B, the letter B stands for, what is it? Very good, young man. Man, right here on the front row, biblical authority, right? You're like, oh man, I forgot, right? Yeah. Uh, biblical authority. In other words, our authority comes from the Word of God, right? That's our sole uh, rule of authority, okay? And then letter A stands for autonomy of the local church, all right? So B, biblical authority. A is autonomy of the local church. P, priesthood of the believer. In other words, that every, every Christian has direct access to God, right? Every one of us. We don't have to go through an individual. We don't have to go through the pastor or a priest or the pope or anybody like that. Every single person has direct access to God. We don't have to go through the saints. We don't have to go through Mary. Uh, we go through Jesus Christ, right? He is that mediator between God and men, okay? And so we have biblical authority, autonomy of the local church. And, and again, autonomy of the local church means that every church is autonomous. Uh, it's uh, Govern, self-governing, self-propagating, like what um, Brother Gandhi was talking about. They're wanting to have that autonomous local church there. Uh, and then P, uh, the priesthood of the believer. And then letter T, the first letter T stood for two ordinances, right? The two ordinances that we find in Scripture, which are baptism and the Lord's Supper, right? Uh, again, where there are many other things that we, we find in Scripture, but we know those are the two ordinances that uh, Christ gave to the church, okay? And so B-A-P-T and then I is what we're going to be looking at tonight, uh, letter I, and that is individual soul liberty, individual soul liberty. Um, you say, well, what does that mean? Well, just kind of think about what it's saying. Individual it means individual persons, not individual churches, but an individual soul, that's who we are, liberty, right? So every person is free, if you wanted to call it, say that, but in some specific areas, and that's what we're going to look at tonight, this idea of individual soul liberty. Now, as Baptists, we believe this uh, doctrine of individual soul liberty, okay? Um, and this doctrine has caused really a lot of suffering uh, for those who hold to it, those Baptists who hold to this individual soul liberty. Um, and it really separates Baptists from many other uh, denominations and movements because, um, as we'll see here, uh, many other religions do not hold to this. They don't hold to individual soul liberty. Okay, um, Protestants, uh, and again, please understand, uh, Baptists are not Protestants. Baptists did not come out of the, uh, the Protestant Reformation. Uh, you have other religions like uh, uh, Lutherans and Presbyterians and others that came out of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, and sometimes they like to group Baptists into that. But Baptists were there uh, long before the Protestant Reformation. We are not Protestants. Okay? Um, and so Protestants as well as Catholics, okay? and please understand what I'm saying here, they have both of those groups have exiled, they have persecuted, they have tortured, and they have killed Baptists for their insistence in belief in individual soul liberty. Now, please understand, I'm not saying that uh, those that are under those religions today, I'm not saying that there's uh, you know, Catholics today that have killed people for that, but if you go back in history, you'll find that uh, the Catholic Church and the Protestants uh, as we've seen before in some of these, um, uh, some of these histor historical things that I said before uh, in some of these other lessons, that there's been great persecution against Baptists through these, uh, through these religions, the Catholics and Protestants and things. Um, now, Baptists believe that God gave the right of choice and the responsibility for that choice to every individual. We believe that every individual has what we would call free will. 
In other words, we have the freedom to choose whether we will accept Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for us, or if we will reject Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, no one can force another person to be saved, right? Uh, we cannot force them to do that. We cannot, um, you know, we, there's nothing you and I can do to force them to do that. They, that's, that's their choice, okay? And in the same way, we, have, we believe that God has given that right of choice, but along with that right of choice is the responsibility for that choice. We're responsible for the choices that we make. Um, we believe that no man's opinion or interpretation is infallible, right? Um, just because someone stands up and says, you know, they're the man of God and this is what it means doesn't mean that that's infallible. It doesn't mean that uh, what he says is true, right? Uh, what are we supposed to do to find out if it's true? Search the scriptures, right? We search the scriptures. We look to the word of God to find out if it's true. Uh, nor are they binding, nor are they to be binding on another's conscience, okay? And we'll get more into this in just a moment. But as Christ is the only Lord of conscience, we have to understand, and we, again, we believe that the Bible teaches this individual soul liberty, okay? Christ, God has given every believer the illumination to understand the Word of God. Uh, God has given us a very special person uh, to help us understand God's Word. Who is that? That's the Holy Spirit, right? Some of you were thinking the pastor, and I appreciate you thinking that I'm a very special person. Uh, but no, it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, God gave us the Holy Spirit. He is our teacher. Remember, Jesus told the disciples, if, if I go not away... The Comforter cannot come. The Holy Spirit cannot come. And He will teach you and guide you into all truth, right? And bring those things to remembrance whatsoever I have commanded you. And so the Holy Spirit is there to help teach us. And so God has given every believer the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit helps uh, illuminate that understanding of the Word of God. So if we wanted to give a definition, the definition then of individual soul liberty would be freedom of religion freedom of conscience, and freedom of choice, right? That's basically what we mean by individual soul liberty. Uh, freedom of religion, in other words, a person is free to choose how they want to worship. You say, well, what if it goes against the Word of God? They, every person has a right of choice, right? Uh, that's why, and we're not going to get into it tonight, we do not believe in a state church, Right? Uh, even though I would say, hey, I believe that Baptists line up uh, the closest to the Word of God, uh, we would not ha try to have a state Baptist church because now what are we trying to do? We're trying to force our beliefs on others and say, if you don't believe this way, then there are going to be consequences that we are going to do. We're going to put you in jail or we're going to torture you or whatever, right? And that's not, that's not right. That's not biblical, right? We have free will. Every person has to make that choice whether they will believe what God says is true or whether they will reject it. We have freedom of conscience, okay? And we'll talk more about this. And I, I really, I don't think I'm going to be able to get into that as much tonight as what I'd like to. I think I'm going to have to have a, a totally different uh, message uh, dealing with uh, conscience because uh, that is something that is, is really misunderstood in our day today in this idea of, uh, of conscience. But then uh, it is also the freedom of choice. And again, with that freedom of choice comes the responsibility of that choice. Someone is free to say, I, I reject Christ and I don't want to be saved. But with that choice comes responsibility as well. If they say, no, I'm not going to accept Christ as my Savior. I'm going to try the church or I'm going to try baptism or I'm going to try this. Then there is a responsibility that comes with that choice. Um, and, of course, we know if somebody rejects Jesus Christ, the Bible says that one day they'll be cast into the lake of fire. You say, well, why? Because of the choice that they made. It's that choice, okay? Um, so as we look at this tonight, I want to, you say, well, where does the Bible talk about this? Well, let's look at a couple passages. First of all, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And again, I, I really want you to grasp this tonight, and even teenagers, I want you to understand this as well. Young people, uh, you need to understand this as well. Um, and I'm sure if 
Maybe if we kind of explain this another day, another way uh, for young people to understand, um, in your home, right, when your mom or your dad says to do something, um, you're supposed to obey, right? right? Isn't that right, guys? Right? Now, you have a choice to make, right? You have a choice whether you're going to obey or whether you're not going to obey. But with that choice comes responsibility, right? And so if you choose to say, well, hey, mom said take out the trash, but I'm not going to take out the trash. I'm just going to do what I want to do. Uh, there's going to be a responsibility with that, <laughs> okay? All right? There's probably going to be some consequences that go along with that because of the choice that you made, okay? And so that's, kind of, that's what we're looking at tonight, this idea of individual soul liberty. In 1 Peter chapter 2, notice in verse number 19, he says, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now think about this. And again, I just kind of want to bring out one part of this. We're not going to get into the whole explanation of this. But notice he says, If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. So notice, there is, there's an individual person here. There's a man, he's talking about an individual person, and notice they're making a choice based upon their conscience, for conscience sake, right? If a man for conscience toward God, okay, and they're making a choice, what is the choice that they're making? What's that? Endure. To endure grief. They're making a decision, right? They're, they're looking at what the situation is, and Toward God, they're, they're saying, for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. So they're saying, look, I haven't done anything wrong, but because of what I believe, I'm going to stand for God, and that brings grief. It brings suffering, okay? Well, who made them do that? Nobody did. Well, how do we know, that, how do we know nobody made him do that? Because of their conscience, right? For conscience toward God. Okay, there's a choice that they have to make, right? Go with me to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. There are many, many different passages of Scripture that, that deal with this. Obviously, there's no way we can get through all of them. But in Revelation chapter 14, or excuse me, Romans chapter 14. Did I say Revelations before? Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, notice as Paul is dealing, is writing to the church of Rome, and in verse number 5 he says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. So what is he saying here? He's giving an example. He says there are two men here, right? Two men, two individuals. One person esteems one day above another. So in other words, this one person says, this is a special day to me. Right? This is a special day to me. This other person says every day is the same. Every day is just alike. There's not really any special days. Right? So you have two people looking at something t two different ways. One says this is special to me. Other one says every day is just the same. Who's right? Who's wrong? Neither one are wrong. They're both right. He says, well, how can they both be right? Because they're both saying two different things. Yes. That's exactly right. Why? And this is what he says in at the end of verse number five. Let every man be fully persuaded, and notice the last four words here, in his own mind. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So, again, every man, each individual, has to be fully persuaded in his own mind mind so each person has to make the decision for themselves so let's say that someone and, and I'm just using this because I know there are people that, that do this and uh, please understand I'm not trying to make light of them uh, if this is what they choose to do that's fine but there are some people that do not celebrate Christmas right some people don't celebrate Christmas they say Jesus wasn't born on December 25th uh, and so we shouldn't celebrate that day as his birth now we, they might celebrate Easter but we're not going to celebrate his birth and there are many other Christians that say hey December 25th we know that may not be the exact day that Jesus was born but we know he was born and so we're going to celebrate that day as the birth of Christ and so we're going to celebrate Christmas 
Who's wrong? Neither one are wrong. Neither one. They're both right. Now, here's where it becomes wrong. And it can become wrong. Come up here, Matthew, for a second. You guys sit on the front row, right? I'm telling you. So, here's Matthew. You got to get over here so the camera can see you, right? You got to be on live stream. (laughs) All right, so here's Matthew. Matthew says, I'm going to celebrate Christmas. I say, no, I don't think, I don't think we should uh, because that's, that's almost like promoting uh, you know, something you know, that we're almost worshiping that day. And so I don't, I don't think we should. So I'm not going to celebrate Christmas. But Matthew says, hey, I, that's the day that Jesus was born. So I'm going to celebrate Christmas. Both are fine. He's right. I'm right. But here's where it becomes wrong. Matthew, you celebrate Christmas. What is wrong with you? Don't you know that that's a devil's day? Don't you know you shouldn't be worshiping? You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be bringing idols into your home? You shouldn't, I mean, you know that's what a Christmas tree is. It's an idol. You're, you're bringing idols. Man, Matthew, what is wrong with you? you? You shouldn't be doing that. What am I doing? I'm trying to push my conscience and my belief on him and say if he doesn't do what I think is right, then he is wrong. You understand what I'm saying here? Okay. What's the problem? I'm wrong. He's not wrong. I am now wrong because I'm trying to push my conscience and my beliefs upon him and say, if you don't accept my conscience and my beliefs, if you don't accept them as your own, you are now wrong. And you are now ungodly. You're some type of wicked person or something like that. Well, what happened to individual soul liberty? What happened to every man being persuaded in his own mind? If he's persuaded in his mind that it's okay to celebrate Christmas, then who am I to try to tell him that he's wrong for not, that he should be like me and not celebrate Christmas? Thank you. You see, this is why this, this is such an important doctrine here, Okay? This is why this is, this is vitally important, okay? Um, and that's why he says, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And we could, we could read through all of chapter 14 because chapter 14 really deals with this, and I would encourage you to go back later and read it yourself. But notice in verse number 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. There's a couple of very key words in here, right? Every one of us, shall give account of who? Himself to God, right? So Matthew is not going to give an account of me to God. Matthew's going to give an account of Matthew to God. I am not going to give an account of Matthew to God. I'm going to give an account of me to God, right? And that's why he says, look, you have to know that, and again, please understand, we're we're not talking about sin here. Okay, sin is wrong. Sin is sin. Okay, there there is no, um, you know. Well, you know, I, I think I'm leaning more to uh, to changing my gender, and so if you if you disagree with that, then uh, then you need to have uh, um, uh, what's what's the word the big word they use now um, tolerance. You need to you need to have tolerance. And look, the Bible is very clear. There's a man and a woman. You're born either you're born a man. Or you're born a woman. That's it. Okay? So we have to understand we're not talking about things that are, that are clear in Scripture that say, look, God says this is wrong. Okay? When we deal with individual soul liberty, there are many things in our life that are not spelled out black and white. Where does it say in black and white whether you should uh, celebrate Christmas or not celebrate Christmas? It's not there, right? 
And, you, and, and again, as, we, as, as time goes on, it's amazing how religions try to bring so many different things and try to say that these are now doctrines, and if you don't do these things, then you're not right with God, and you're a sinner, and things like that, okay? And this is why he says, let every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. You must give an account of what you have done to God. I must give an account of what I have done to God. Okay, And that's why what I do, and that's why he said back in verse number 5, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I have to make sure that what I'm doing, I believe, lines up with Scripture. And you need to do what you believe is lining up with Scripture. Okay? And, and if we say, well, I can't, I can't find an exact Scripture for it. So, for example, all right? Let's kind of take this a little bit step farther. And I, I'm really getting ahead of myself here, and I, I hate that, but oh well. Um, so let's say, for example, that... Um, no, I'm not going to do it. Let's, let's just stick here. Um, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. I, I put stuff in my notes to set the foundation everything, and then I try to start building walls and put the roof on before I've got the foundation done. So I got I to make sure we get the foundation here, right? Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 2. But having renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So again, notice what Paul says. We're commending ourselves to every man's conscience, right? We are, we're doing what we are supposed to do, okay? We're, we're handling the word of God properly. We're teaching the word of God, right? We're, we're being careful not to say that God says something when God doesn't say something. And we're careful not to say God didn't say it when God does say it, okay? Did you follow me on that right there, Okay. We've got to be very careful because so many times we can, maybe because of background or maybe because of culture or maybe because of preference or something, we can think that our way is right, but because somebody else doesn't do that, we start looking down upon them when there's nowhere in Scripture that actually backs up one way or the other. Right, And so Paul is saying, look, we are, we're teaching the Word of God, we're making sure that we're handling the Word of God properly, right, by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So Paul's saying, look, we're teaching the truth, we're teaching the Word of God, but here's the thing, is Paul saying, now that I've taught it, you must believe it. Is that what he's saying? It's not what he's saying. He's saying, I'm teaching it, and I'm... I'm we're doing the right job of teaching it, but what's he saying? It's up to you. It's up to you whether you accept it. It's up to you whether you believe it or not, right? We're commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Again, that's why even Paul says that the, those of, of Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so, right? So I can preach something, but... If you go back and look and say, wait a minute, that's not, that's not in Scripture. Just because I preached it and just because I said it, but if you go back and search and you say, that's not in Scripture, uh, we got a problem, don't we? Right? And that's why it's so important for Christians to know the Word of God, to know what God has said, to be able to say, wait a minute, hold on, is, is that really in Scripture? Or is this just maybe a preference? Or is this just maybe something culturally or, uh, or, or what, right? Uh, and, and so this is very important. So in other words, when we're talking about individual soul liberty, no one should be forced against their will to assent to any belief or ritual now, this does not exempt someone from their responsibility to the Word of God or from their accountability to God Himself. But we cannot force a person against their will or against their conscience to, to believe something or to do something that they do not believe is right. We can't do that. Okay? 
Uh, and Baptists have always opposed um, this type of religious persecution. Okay? Um, Jeremiah Jeter, who is uh, a preacher of long ago, said, The liberty to worship God according to the dictates of conscience is the dearest of all human rights. That it should ever be denied is one of the strongest proofs of human fallibility. You say, is it really trying to be denied? Absolutely. It really is. Now, we'll see the key elements in individual soul liberty when we compare it with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. What is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Uh, This false doctrine is actually identified by the Lord in the book of Revelation. If you go back to Revelation chapter 2 with me. In Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, both in the church of Ephesus and in the church of Pergamos, or excuse me, uh, in the church of Ephesus, yes, and the church of Pergamos. Look in verse number 6, as he's writing to the church of Ephesus, he says, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So he's commending the church of Ephesus, he says, look, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans. And he says, notice, which I also hate. So God says that he hates the work of the Nicolaitans. Jesus Christ said that. Well, what is the work of the Nicolaitans? Okay. If we go to verse 15, he, we find something again. He says um, in verse 14, he says, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So two churches, he points out this, these Nicolaitans, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And in both places, he says, I hate it, I hate it. I'm against it, I hate it. Right? So what is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Okay. Well, the word Nicolaitan is actually what we call a transliteration. In other words, there's not really an English word that described it. And so they basically just assigned English letters to the equivalent Greek letters, right? Um, Because there was really no word for it in the English language, okay? Now, in a minute, I'll describe it to you, and I think you'll understand it. But they basically assign an English letter to the Greek letter without actually translating the word, okay? Um, The word Nicolaitan is actually, it's two words. It is the word Nikai, which means to conquer, to overcome, or to rule, and Laos, which means the common man, the people, or the laity. Did you catch it? So the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, or what Christ is saying, this this thing that he hates about the Nicolaitans was they were ruling or conquering or overcoming the common man, the people, or the laity. They were basically the group of religious leaders establishing a hierarchy over the church. And if you didn't do what they say, you're out. How many, and and please understand, look, I'm I'm not trying to to cause anyone to be upset or angry or anything tonight. I'm I'm just giving it to you how it is. How many religions today are following the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? where there is a hierarchy type system that you must do what they say and there's no choice about it. Why do you think we have what they refer to as the dark ages? Why do you think there was such great persecution? Because there were those that were saying, no, you can't force us to believe that way. You can't force us to baptize babies. You can't force us to accept unsaved people in the church you can't force us to do these things and these religions says yes we can and if you don't do it we'll kill you and Jesus said I hate it why 
because it goes completely against Scripture. It goes against the doctrine of individual soul liberty, that every one of us has a conscience and we cannot be forced, our will cannot be forced to do something. We have to make that decision ourselves and be willing to do it. And you look at some of the the largest religions in the world today, and they're very easily, you could put them right underneath the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It's a hierarchy type system. They're ruling and lording over the people. The the Nicolaitan doctrine presents itself sometimes, and they try to lord or conquer over the individual by taking the place of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. There are three areas that this doctrine of the Nicolaitans attacks individual soul liberty. We're going to look at those tonight, if we can, hopefully. Um. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get through all this tonight. Yeah, 36 minutes. 36 minutes from now? Is that what we're doing? We're starting the timer now? 36 minutes? Okay. We might be able to do that. Uh, all right, so let's look at a couple of these three things. The, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And again, think with me about some of these religions. I don't have to name them. <laughs> it's pretty obvious who they are. Right, And not all of them are under the, 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 the banner of Christianity. Now, there are some that are under the banner of Christianity, but not all of them are under the banner of Christianity. Right? So what do we find? First of all, we find the necessity of creeds and councils. Okay? In other words, a church is not able to make decisions for themselves unless they get the consent of a higher body or person, whether that would be the Pope, the priests, cardinals, archbishops, bishops, uh, you know, imams, you know, whatever it might be, right? No, that, that church cannot make the decision itself. You have to get that decision made from a higher body of whatever, right? Well, number one, that goes against the autonomy of the local church, because each church is supposed to be a local, independent, autonomous church. And to have to go out to another governing body to decide what is done goes against the autonomy of the local church. It also goes against the individual soul liberty. When a higher body or a person gives a command, then it must be followed and not be questioned. You don't question it. You just follow it. Uh, doesn't matter whether you like it or not. You just do it. Because if you don't do it, uh, you're going to have lots of problems. Persecution, excommunication, whatever it might be. The other thing is we also must be very careful about written works. Because most religions follow some form of written work from their founder. And so we have to realize that only the Word of God has absolute authority. Now again, that's not to say there aren't good books out there to read. Okay? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that there aren't authors that can write good books, maybe a book about marriage or a book about child rearing or a book about, uh, you know, overcoming uh, different things going on in our life. No, that's fine. Those those can be good books to read, but those books are not our authority. Our authority is the Word of God. And when we go outside of this book for our authority, right, now we're saying that now some man... Not God, but some man now has authority. Uh, and, and we have to follow what they have said. And again, our authority must come back to the Word of God. And so, th- again, there are, there are many religions that there is that higher body or that, that higher person that you have to go to. And, uh, you know, if you, uh, you have to do exactly what they say. And if you don't do what they say, then... then then you're just going to be, you know, you're just going to be out, and it's it's not going to go well. Again, that goes against individual soul liberty because now you're trying to force someone's will to do something that they may not believe in, right? Which is happening a lot. We see number two, this doctrine of the Nicolaitans really basically says that you as a lay person or anyone as a lay person or somebody that has not been well educated cannot understand the Bible, so therefore don't read it. 
You say, no one would ever say that. Um, you might want to step outside of your house and look around a little bit. <laughs> because there are many religions that say that just a common person unless you've been well-educated in theology and things like that, that you cannot understand Scripture. You can't understand the Bible. You have to go to someone to be able to get that teaching and knowledge, and so you shouldn't even read the Bible. You shouldn't even have one. In fact, there are some religions, if you have one, they, they'll take it from you, and they'll, they'll burn it, they'll confiscate it. Okay? Um, so you don't have the ability to understand it. You don't have the ability to apply the Word of God. Uh, and again, please understand, I'm not saying that education uh, is not important. I'm not saying that education cannot help you to better understand uh, the Bible. But to say that you cannot understand the things of God without some type of degree or without this person explaining it to you is not right. That's, that's against the Word of God, right? Uh, God's Word is for every person. Uh, when you go back and you study the Roman Catholic Church, you'll find that the hierarchy there actually forbade the reading of the Bible by anyone who was not authorized by the church. If you were not authorized by the church, then you were not allowed to have a Bible. And again, this is what ushered in the, what we would call the Dark Ages uh, because the Bible was denied to the common man. They tried to keep it from the common man. And uh, that's why I, I, I might get the name wrong here, and if I do, I apologize, but I believe it was, uh, was it William Tyndale that said um, that his desire was to get the Word of God printed so that the, the plowboy would be able to have a copy and read the Word of God. Was it William Tyndale? Is that right? I think that's who it was. Um, so think about this. Here's a man that says, hey, even, even a plowboy, even, even a, a kid that, uh, man, they, they've not gone to school. They, they've, just, they, they've just been behind a plow all their life. But even he can understand the word of God. Why? God's word is for everyone. In Psalms 119, verse 130, it says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Right? And so God's Word is the, the thing that can truly change someone's life. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so we find the need in the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. There is that hierarchy-type system. There is a denial of the Word of God and an understanding of the Word of God. By the way, if, if that's true, then why did Jesus say, I'm going to give you the comforter who can help you understand it? then if that's true, if only certain people can understand it, then that means all of us don't have the Holy Spirit. That means only certain people have the Holy Spirit, and that means Jesus is a liar. Because Jesus said that every one of us would have the Holy Spirit. If you believe, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and dwelling you, and yet the Holy Spirit was given so that we could know the Word of God and understand God's Word, every one of us. And then we find the third thing that we really find here in, um, is, if you wanted to call it, it's a, a very controlling or maybe even a hyper-controlling leader, okay? Uh, and this is when a pastor or a leader steps over the bounds that God has given him and begins to assume the role of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. So now this leader or this a pastor or whoever he is begins to basically say, uh, you cannot understand the things of God and therefore you cannot make decisions for yourself, so I need to make the decisions for you and you have to follow the decisions that I tell you to make. And the error here, again, is that the Nicolaitans were, were crushing the, the believer's ability to, to discern the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, God, again, God gave us His Holy Spirit so that He could guide us and He could teach us and He could uh, help us to understand Scripture. Uh, Matthew 23.10 warns of being masters to other believers. Uh, remember, Jesus said, call no man master. He said, we have one master, and that is our, our Father in heaven. Uh, even why Peter in 1 Peter 5.3 talks about how a pastor should not be lords over God's heritage. He says, neither being lords over God's heritage, but being an ensample to the flock, right? The pastor is not to lord over it. Uh, I remember in, uh, when I first 
came across this, I was really shocked about it, but we were getting ready to have a, uh, a special function at our church in, in Mbali, and um, we were going to have food and things. I don't remember what the occasion was, but um, as we were making the preparations for it, uh, some of the, the ladies and some of the men came up and they said, Pastor, where would, where would you like to eat? I said, what do you mean, where would I like to eat? They said, well, you know, in these other, you know, in many of the religions and things that we came from, the pastor never eats with the people. The pastor is always separated from the people. And not only that, but we have to fix you different type of food than we fix everyone else. And not only that, but it can't even be, you can't even use the same pots and pans and things that you cook everybody else's food in. Yours has to be separate. I said, you're nuts. That's crazy. Can you imagine that? The pastor saying that I can't eat with just members of my church and my food has to be special and different than everybody else's. And, and not only that, but to be so nuts to be able to say, I mean, you can't even use the same pots that you use other I mean, you have to use special pots that are just mine, you know, only for me. There's something wrong there. Very, very wrong. Okay? And that's why he says here, we're not to be lords over God's heritage. And I know, some, I know sometimes, you know, when, when you're raised, many, maybe some of you have been raised in a Baptist church, and, and this has maybe been all you've known, and this is just mind-blowing, but really, that can really happen? Folks, that's not just happening in Africa. That's happening in America as well. That's happening in America as well. Okay? Um, of course, the pastor is the overseer. He's the, the under-shepherd of the, the flock that God has entrusted him with. And he, he does have the responsibility to warn and instruct and to preach and to teach and in all the areas where the Word of God speaks. Uh, and a godly pastor will strive to, to teach his flock to, uh, to see the world through the Bible, right? Not through the pastor's eyes, but through God's eyes. That's what we ought to be looking for. Not, well, how does Pastor Andrew view this? No, how does God view it? What difference does it make how Pastor Andrew views it? Pastor Andrew's not God. So we have to go back to the Word of God. And that's why he says in Romans chapter 14, as we saw there in, in verse number 5, one man says that they esteem one day, and another man says that all days are alike. What did he say? Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Each individual has to be fully persuaded. Again, in 2 Corinthians 4.2, Paul says that he simply showed the truth and commended it to every man's conscience. Paul couldn't force people to believe. They had to choose for themselves. So please, please get this. It's the pastor's job to preach, to teach, and administrate. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict and to sanctify. And unfortunately, and, and I'm, I'm going to speak very freely tonight, unfortunately, even in a lot of what we would say, even Baptist churches, we are getting the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. I am so shocked many times at what I hear happening in other churches and supposedly supposed to be independent Baptist churches. Pastors lording over and saying, if you don't do what I say, then you're out. And you can't understand the Bible the way I understand it. I have a special gift and calling from God, so you have to listen to me and do what I say. Look, you have the same Holy Spirit I have. Same Holy Spirit. We don't have two different Holy Spirits. You, if you're saved, have the exact same Holy Spirit that I have. No different. God says that the pastor is to be the, the example. He's supposed to study the Word of God and teach the Word of God. But look, I'm not the Holy Spirit. It's not my job to come into your home and say, this is how you're supposed to you're supposed to live your life in your home. No, that's not my job. My job is simply to teach the Word of God. Your job is to decide what you're going to do with it. <laughs> I 
I got an easy job. <laughs> Sometimes. It really is. That, that's, and I think we have, we have put almost, we've put more pressure on ourselves than what's really needed. Because I'm not going to give an account to you. I'm not, I'm not going to have to stand before God and give an account of how you lived your life. You are. You're going to have to stand before God and give an account of, hey, when the pastor preached and you saw it was in the word of God and it was very clear and it was there and God said to do it, did you do it? And when the Holy Spirit worked in your heart and said, hey, that's something you need to do and you said, no, I'm not going to do it, that's not on me. That's on you. Because every one of us have a free choice and, but with that choice comes responsibility. How will we respond? How will we answer to what we know is right and wrong? Now, again, I really don't have time tonight to get into this whole idea of conscience and things. And um, I'll, take a, I'll take another whole uh, message to deal with this. But we have to really understand, look, just because someone doesn't do something the exact same way that we think it ought to be done doesn't mean that they are less of a Christian than we are. And when, for us to start looking down our nose at them and say, well, they don't do it the way I do it, and I, I must be more spiritual to them, can I tell you something? That just showed how spiritual you are. Amen. That just showed how spiritual you are. Because if you, th again... If, if, if Matthew says, hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to celebrate, and I say I'm not going to celebrate, and we're good with that. I, you know, on Christmas, Matthew's probably not going to invite me to come over. <laughs> I'm good with that, right? Because he celebrates it. I don't. Again, I'm, this is an example, okay? Don't go out thinking, man, what's wrong with Matthew? Matthew doesn't celebrate Christmas. Go up to Rob and Kelly. What's the matter with you guys? You don't celebrate Christmas? What's wrong with you people? Um, don't do that. I'm, this is an example, okay? But for me to try to say, well, he must be somehow less spiritual than me, right? I mean, think about it. When you go on in, in Romans chapter 14, it even talks about one says that they choose to eat meat, another one says that they don't eat meat. Who's right? Who's wrong? They're both right. If somebody comes and says, you know what, it's just, it's just my personal conviction that I'm not going to eat a certain type of meat, or I'm not going to eat any meat. You know, maybe, you know, I've just, I've looked at this, and, and I, I know the Bible says we're free to, and, but I, I've just looked at this, and this is a personal conviction of mine, I'm just, I'm not going to eat meat. That's fine. That's fine. Now, and I will say this, sometimes, sometimes we joke about things that we shouldn't joke about. Right? Because sometimes those of us that would say, well, I'm going to eat meat, we're like, well, I feel sorry for you because you don't eat meat. What are we saying? What are we saying? We're saying your decision's dumb. Hello? Yes. Amen. Yep. Well, you know, if you're not going to eat meat, that's fine, but, you know, you're, you're missing out on these ribs, and you're missing out on this nice, thick, juicy steak. How is that helping him? What are we saying to him? We're saying, what you have decided is ridiculous, and you need to change and be like me. Really? Who made you God? Right? Right? And that's what I'm saying. Sometimes we have to be, sometimes we can joke around about things that really, in how we're even joking around about it, is basically saying, you're wrong. You need to be like me. And this is why we have to be very, very careful when we're dealing with conscience and individual soul liberty. Because if somebody says, hey, you know what, I've, I've decided that, that I'm not going to eat meat, and if you want to eat meat, that's fine, I'm not, look, I'm not going to look down on you because you eat meat, and this brother over here says, hey, I think it's okay to eat meat, and it's okay for you not to eat meat, and I'm not, I'm not going to look down on you for not eating meat, you know who's right? Both of them. They're both right. Because they're both doing what they feel that God wants them to do. They're both fully persuaded in their own mind. 
Both are right. But for one of them to start looking down at the other and saying, because you don't do it my way, you don't do it the way I think it should be done, you're somehow less than me, you're less spiritual than I am, or, well, wait a second. Aren't we trying to now force our will and our decision and our preferences onto someone else who may not see it the same way? Again, we're not, we're not talking about sin here. We're not talking about saying if there's blatant sin and, you know, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about really this idea of, of preference and even, even in, in doctrine, right? Look, all I can do is preach. Just like Paul said, all I can do is preach the word of God. It's up to you what you do with it. I can't force you to do it, right? Right? I mean, we, we, we preach about going out and giving out tracts and telling people about Jesus and, uh, and inviting them to church. I can't force you to do that. Do we know it's biblical? Yes, God said to go. But am I going, is it my job to go around to every person and say, okay, how many tracts did you give out this week? How many tracts did you give out this week? How many doors did you knock this week? Who did you invite to church this week? How many, how many tracts? How many tracts? How many tracts? How many? That's not my job. Whose job is it? It's the Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit's the one that's supposed to be telling you, hey, that person, that person needs Jesus. Now, I can can show it to you from Scripture and say, hey, this is what we're supposed to do, and this is what we need to be doing, and and we need to be active in this, and we have the materials for this, and so, hey, I'm saying, let's go do it. But it's not my job to follow up on every person and say, hey, did you do it? Did you do it? Did you do it? Did you do it? See, I'm... I'm commending the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God to you and to your conscience, and you have to decide what choice you will make with it. But again, remember, with every choice we make, we're responsible for that choice. And that's why Paul says we are to be fully persuaded in our own mind, right? It's a very interesting topic, isn't it, right? It's something that is not taught a lot about. It's not taught. Why? Because churches don't like for it to be taught. If I, if I teach this, then I'm going to lose control. Lose control? What control did you have anyway? What control do you think you have? I don't have control. I mean, look around. Look at you people. I have no control. <laughs> no, we have, we have a great time. But I'm not sitting here, man, if, if I... You know, if I've, I've got to teach this and I've got to say, you've got to do this and I've got to follow up because if not, I, I'm losing control. Wait, it's not my church. Right. And you don't belong to me. You belong to him. And you're not going to be accountable to me. You're going to be accountable to him. And I'm going to be accountable to him. Every one of us. That's why every one of us each has to do that which we have fully persuaded in our own mind. Are there limitations? Yes. And we're not going to be able to get into those tonight. There are limitations, though, to our individual soul liberty. We'll look at those another night. But can I say it's, again, think about this. The Bible says that in Christ, we've been taken out of bondage and we have liberty in Christ. We have liberty in Christ. Freedom. Freedom to worship the way that we believe the Bible says to worship. Freedom to make our own choices, knowing that with those choices, there are responsibilities that we are accountable for. Freedom to live how we want to live. But our authority must be the Word of God. And when any of those decisions that we make go beyond the authority of the word of God it's not me that you give an account to it's not the church that you give an account to it's God and that's why we have to make sure that what we're doing is in agreement with the word of God making sure that we're in 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 line with the word of God and if not and if there's something that's not clear I have to just make sure, look, if, if, if this is not a sin, right? Look, it's not a sin to eat meat, and it's not a sin not to eat meat. 
It's not a sin not to celebrate Christmas, and it's not a sin to celebrate Christmas, right? So these are things that are not sin, so how do, we, how do we distinguish it? How do we know who's right? They both are. And I have to be willing to respect the decision that they make just as much as I want them to respect the decision that I make. That's called grace, showing grace to one another. Amen? Let's pray together tonight. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, even in this topic that we're looking at of individual soul liberty, Lord, maybe there are some tonight that had no clue, was not aware of this doctrine. Maybe there are others that that have known this doctrine. Lord, I thank you that when we come to you, you set us free from bondage. And you give us liberty in Christ. Lord, obviously, our desire as a child of God should not just be to live for self and say, well, I'm free in Christ so I can do whatever I want to do. No, Lord, we know there are boundaries. We know there are limitations. Lord, we also know that we each have a choice to make. We each must choose whether we will accept Jesus Christ or not. We each must choose whether we will be obedient to your word or not. So, Father, help us to understand with those choices that we make that we are responsible for the choices. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we even look a little bit more into this in the coming weeks. Lord, that you would truly help us to show grace to one another. Lord, we're so different. It's come from many different backgrounds and uh, some from different styles of culture and things. And so, Father, preferences and things like this are going to vary vastly. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to show grace to one another. Lord, help us to, to know that we have that liberty in Christ and every one of us, that individual soul liberty knowing that it's not the pastor to lord over them. It's, it's not a church or a denomination, although we are accountable to the church that we are members of, and we're accountable to uh, the pastor, and he's the, uh, the under-shepherd there to watch out for us. But, Lord, we know that ultimately we're accountable to you. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us. And Lord, maybe tonight, Lord, Maybe there's some that may have not been showing this grace to others. Maybe there's some that just need to say, Lord, I I need you to help me with this because I don't want to use my liberty as a stumbling block to others. I don't want to use my, my liberty to cause others to fall. And I don't want to use my liberty to sin. And so, Lord, would you help me and allow your Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me. So, Father, I pray you'd help us in this it's so important lord that we we look to you we do what you would have us to do and that we'd be fully persuaded in our own mind that this is what god wants for me father would you help us with this with their heads bowed and our eyes closed the piano is just going to play softly you don't have to stand you can just stay in your seat tonight maybe god spoke into your heart about something this evening Maybe there's something you need to talk to the Lord about tonight. Showing grace to others. Maybe it's getting in the Word of God and knowing so that you can be fully persuaded in your own mind what God would have you to do. Are you being obedient to what you know God says in His Word is right? No one can force you to do it. But with the choices that we make, we will stand accountable for them.
Amen. God bless you for being here tonight. And I hope that's a little bit of a help to you tonight. And again, I, I will be dealing more with this in, uh, in a few weeks and things. Um, and uh, so I hope maybe I can uh, help maybe answer some questions and things. But uh, it's very, very important that we understand this um, because this is something that is not taught um, in many churches and many religions. And uh, you say, well, that's all those people that aren't Baptist. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's even in not being taught in Baptist churches as well. And it's something we need to know, we need to understand, uh, because we're, we're accountable for it. So I hope it'll be a help to you. Um, let's go ahead and stand together. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Don't forget, Ladies Tuesday at uh, 7 o'clock, right there for Ladies of Faith. And then men come out and join us on Saturday uh, at 9 o'clock for breakfast and a good time in the Word of God fellowship. And, and man, I'm telling you, it's just, always, it's just wonderful. Uh, it's such a blessing to be around uh, other Christians and, uh, and just, uh, uh, just be an encouragement to one another and the fellowship. It's, it's a blessing. So uh, don't forget about those things coming up, all right? Let's go ahead and be dismissed in a word of prayer. And again, just thank the Lord for what he's done. Brother Jay, would you dismiss in prayer, please?